And everybody, Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Boy, do we got a lot of news to get into here today. I was not here yesterday, and so I've got two days worth of stuff to catch up on. Not the least of which is the Wednesday night ratings and demos, everybody's favorite. Now listen, sometimes it's just the same story. If it's just the same story, I talk about it and I move on. But over the last couple of weeks, it has not been the same story. Raw hitting an all-time low viewership, all-time low rating. That's a story. And what happened with AEW and NXT this past Wednesday, on the surface it wasn't that much of a story. AEW won in total viewers and they won all of the demos except age 50 plus. That happens 90% of the time. Not much of a story. But there is one story that I'm going to tell you about, that if you have not read The New Observer, you know nothing about. If you have read The New Observer, I will tell you this story and you will be shocked again, as shocked as I was when I first heard this story. But we got that, and of course it is a very, very busy weekend. We have got three pay-per-views. I guess one isn't a pay-per-view, but there's a UFC show on Saturday night. There is the Impact Slammiversary show on Saturday night. And of course, yes everyone, on Sunday... It is the horror show at Extreme Rules, where in the Rey Mysterio-Seth Rollins match, the only way to win is to pluck the other person's eyeball out of their head. It will be dangling by a cord. That is what they are billing this match as. Unless today on Survivor or SmackDown they announce, ah, eh, too horrible. Now you just win via pinfall or submission. I don't expect that to happen. They are... Digging their heels in on this stipulation. We'll give you the full card for that show. We got cards for AEW next week, NXT next week, SmackDown here tonight, and your phone calls, emails, text messages, and more. It's going to be a fun day here on the show. Be back after the break, Observer Live. Wrestling Observer Live, flying solo here today. Everybody's fine. Mike is fine. Jim is fine. I am fine. And I got a lot to get into here today. We are going to take your phone calls and text messages later. If you want to call, I'll give you that number after a while. Phone lines are not open yet, but I will take your text messages and emails for now. Text message line 425-780-7566. It's open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. 425-780-7566. Sometimes I'll be just hanging out and I'll get some wacky text Alerting me about something I haven't watched yet on SmackDown. Can't wait for those tonight. And Brian at WrestlingObserver.com is the email. You can follow me on Twitter at Brian Alvarez. Obviously, we're on Sports Byline Radio and Twitch.tv slash F4W Video. And this coming Sunday, I'll talk more about it later. But if you're a subscriber to Twitch.tv, we will, in fact, have a special post show immediately after the horror show at Extreme Rules live on Twitch.tv for Twitch subscribers, which you can do via a variety of means, including your Amazon Prime account. Every month you get a free Amazon Prime subscription to Twitch. You can use it on any channel you want. That includes ours. So if you have Amazon Prime, which a lot of you do, you can subscribe for free and get our post show on Sunday, which will, in fact, be a fundraiser for The Great Fowler. Every, every dime, every penny, every dollar... Every Bitcoin that we make via cheers goes to the Great Fowler. So Wednesday, despite competition from both NASCAR on FS1 and UFC on ESPN, Dynamite had his highest viewership since May, scored a big win over NXT and the USA Network. Fight for the Fallen, headlined by a world title match, which was supposed to take place last week, averaged 788,000 viewers, compared to NXT's 631,000. First time Dynamite has won the viewership battle in four weeks. I saw a headline on some other site. It was something like, Dynamite finally wins in total viewers over NXT. I thought, finally. I guess I guess technically if it's been three weeks of losing, it is finally. But, I mean, they've won 90% of the time. It was kind of a strange headline. But viewership for Dynamite up 10.2%. 18 to 49, Dynamite averaged a .29 rating, fifth for the night on cable. Chris Jericho did a promo calling himself the Demo God, stating that he had never lost 
in the prized 18 to 49 demo. And I saw that and I thought, man, rolling the dice here, baby. When you when you do something like that, you're rolling the dice. Well, apparently this is why I don't gamble, because he not only won, the show not only won, I guess it would be the whole show. They not only won in the 18 to 49 demo, they doubled NXT in the 18 to 49 demo. NXT 0.14, down 30% from last week. Second lowest number in that demo the show has ever done on the USA Network. So, as I noted in the opening segment, this is largely the usual story. AW wins in the total viewership most of the time. There have been now exceptions. They always win in the demos, except 50+, plus, which NXT always wins. So I'm sure you're asking, well, what's what's new here? What's the story? Besides that they doubled NXT in the 18-49 to 49 demo. Well, this is from the New Observer. AW did strongly in males 35-49. to 49. NXT did disastrous in men 18-34. to 34. AW won every key demo, but women 35-49 to 49 was surprisingly close. In the 18-34 to 34 demo... AEW did 70,000 men, okay? So around this country, around the United States, among men 18 to 34, the young male audience, 70,000 people around the country watched AEW. Do you know what the number of 18 to 49-year-old males was for NXT? AEW was 70,000. How many 18 to 34 men do you think were watching NXT on Wednesday night? Well, the answer is 6,000. 6,000 18 to 49 year old men in the entire United States were watching NXT. As Dave notes here, that's not a misprint. The number was down. 87.2% from last week. Obviously, there was competition. NASCAR and UFC were were strong in those demos. But this is something that we've been talking about for a while on the main roster. But this is mind-blowing. This is NXT. This This is the promotion. They're unlike the main roster. They, you know, got the young stars doing the high-flying action. I mean, this is supposed to be, of the three brands, Raw, SmackDown, and NXT, NXT is supposed to be the youngest, coolest, hippest, whatever the cool word is nowadays. That's supposed to be this brand. They did only 6,000 men 18 to 34 in the entire country watching NXT. It's mind-blowing. The uh, the younger audience, uh, 12 to 17, I don't have it in front of me, but it was only slightly higher than that. NXT and WWE, they have a tiny amount of younger viewers. Their median age is sky high. Why are no young people watching these shows? And when I say no young people, I mean, we're getting to the nitty gritty here. 6,000 people in the whole country. That's your 18 to 34 audience. And then 12 to 17 was only very slightly higher than that. So they're not getting kids. They're not getting teenagers. They're not getting anybody under the age of 34. It's shocking. Anyway, those are the numbers there. So there you go. And of course, the raw number, the all-time low, that is leading to the extreme, the horror show at Extreme Rules, as it is called. And this is the full lineup as of right now. Obviously, on SmackDown tonight, they will... They will add more. Uh, This, by the way, for some reason does not count. The bar fight, which I thought that Jeff Hardy made official, but it's Jeff Hardy versus Sheamus at a bar fight. We got Drew McIntyre, Dolph Ziggler for the WWE title. We got Asuka versus Sasha Banks for the women's title. We got Bayley versus Nikki Cross for the SmackDown women's title. Braun Strowman is facing Bray Wyatt in a swamp fight. And actually, it's not a swamp fight. It's a Wyatt swamp fight. That's apparently different. We got Rey Mysterio, Seth Rollins, eye for an eye. The match can only be won when one competitor extracts the eye 
of their opponent. You must pull somebody's eyeball out. And Apollo Crews will be facing MVP for the U.S. title. So seven matches announced and probably more coming up on SmackDown tonight. But that's the lineup for the Sunday horror show at Extreme Rules. For Slammiversary, we got Ace Austin, Eddie Edwards, and Trey, and a mystery opponent, a former world champion for the Impact World title. I don't know this, okay? But my presumption would be that the fourth individual here will be EC3. But I don't know that for sure. We got Jordan Grace versus Deanna Parazzo for the Impact Knockouts title. Willie Mack versus Chris Bay for the X Division title. We got a gauntlet for the gold to determine the number one contender for the women's title. Alicia Edwards, Havoc, Kira Hogan, Kimberly, Kylie Ray, Navia, Madison Rain, Rosemary, Susie, Tasha Steeles, and Taya Valkyrie. The North will be facing Ken Shamrock and Sammy Callahan. Moose will be facing Tommy Dreamer. And the Rascals will be facing uh, TBD in a tag team match, which uh, anytime there's a TBD on this show, because Impact has been pushing so strongly that a bunch of former Impact stars that had been working for uh, WWE are going to be returning on the show because they are all free and clear. I would presume that that's going to be a former team. Will it be Gallows and Anderson? Well, I can't say that 100%. It could be. All I know is if if I had signed Gallows and Anderson, I'd announce that match. But it's a TBD here. Maybe they want a big surprise. So more on this after the break. Calls, text messages, everything. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Oh, Brian Alvarez here, uh, Wrestling Observer Live. This coming Sunday, we have a very special post show after the horror show at Extreme Rules only for Twitch subscribers. So I strongly recommend signing up using your Amazon Prime account. Don't forget, it expires every month, and you got to sign up again for free using your Amazon Prime subscription or however you choose to sign up. But as noted, it's going to be a very special show. We'll recap the horror show at Extreme Rules. It is a fundraiser for the great Fowler, who has got a lot of medical bills, got a lot of issues, but we're here to support him, and we'll be doing that on Sunday. 100% of your cheers will go to the great Fowler. And, and, we have a very special surprise that is going to kick off Sunday's show. And you will be the first to know if you subscribe via Twitch to that show, airing immediately after the horror show at Extreme Rules. Mm Hmm. That's me scratching my chin. This person here says, Thanks to Chris Jericho and AEW running ads, I went to shop AEW, found out they have tons of cool merchandise. Why can't WWE be creative like this and make such products? Well, what products are you talking about? A towel with Orange Cassidy's face? They got a lot of they got a lot of cool things at the at the WWE shop site. I think it's called Shop WWE Shop now. They got rid of Shop Zone, if I recall correctly. But you know, WWE has been doing things a certain way forever. And they also have a very patterned way of doing things. And AEW is more like an independent promotion in the sense that they do some stuff. If something feels like it's getting over, they immediately market it. And WWE does that to a degree as well. I mean, they, you know, for a while when Daniel Bryan had the belt made out of hemp, you know, they were selling that belt on the WWE shop for an extraordinary amount of money, by the way. And the Fiends title, you know, they quickly had that thing up at at the WWE shop. So they do things like that. I mean, it's not just AEW. Per says, Jericho is completely validated in bragging about the 18 of 49 demo, especially since he has not touched 50 yet. He himself is still a part of that money demo. I think he is still 49. Let's see when Chris Jericho turns the big 5-0. Chris Jericho is 49 years old. November 9! November 9, he moves out of the money demo. We'll see what happens then. I'm sure he's got some sort of idea. These guys like Jericho and the Bucks are so innovative when it comes to marketing and selling merch. I have already ordered my Demo God and Christian AF t-shirts. Meanwhile, WWE gets zero pennies from me because all of their stuff is generic and uncreative. Well, you do know that if you go to the WWE shop, you can buy a replica winged eagle belt 
with the greatest belt that WWE has ever produced. I think they got a 25% off sale right now. Belt's fantastic. I know Tim in Miami would say, Ha! I got a, a genuine Reggie Parks belt. It's much better than the WWE version. Dude, these WWE versions, they're pretty nice. They're available at the shop, if I recall correctly. Do you think that AEW and Impact should announce new signings in advance or tease them for ratings and buy rate purposes? There is no answer to this question. The answer is, and you will not like this, but it depends. So what I mean by that is, if you've got a loaded show and you've got a big main event and there's a lot of buzz for the show, then do a surprise. You know, people, wrestling fans, like to be surprised. They like it when somebody shows up that they weren't expecting. But if you don't have a loaded show, if you've just got a nothing happening show, but you've got a big person who you're going to debut, then you got to advertise it. The answer is it depends. For example, I was ranting about this yesterday, the NXT show this week. I was, I'm a fan of Tegan Knox. I was excited for Tegan Knox and Io Shirai. But WWE had just done two weeks of the Great American Bash. They had done a Sasha and Bailey main roster tag team championship match the first week. And the second week, they had billed a double title match. Keith Lee was going to fight for both his North American title and Adam Cole's NXT title. Both big matches. Those matches led to them beating AEW in viewership. But then, now what? It's always the question. Now what? And for the following week's NXT... They announced that Io Shirai was facing Tegan Knox, who won the title in a random four-way, or won the title shot in a random four-way, and Damian Priest and Cameron Grimes, which I've seen several times. I like both of the guys, but I've seen the match. Now, they were going to end up doing Keith Lee versus Dominic Dijakovic, a rematch of one of their best matches of the last couple of years for both titles. But they didn't advertise it. They wanted to make it a surprise. All they advertised was that Keith Lee was going to address the WWE Universe. Now, if they'd had a big show, five matches announced, a bunch of big matches, fine. Do an impromptu announcement of a double title match. But they didn't have that. They had one title match, which was, you know, it was a match. Uh, Tegan Knox, I mean, to do this right, Tegan's got to do like a long journey road to the title. They didn't do that. It was just she won a four-way, she's getting a title shot. They had that in a rematch. It's all they had. So in that case, no, this should not be a surprise. You should advertise your big money match. But they didn't do that. They made it a surprise. That, to me, was a mistake. For Slammiversary, if it's me and I got Gallows and Anderson, I announced Gallows and Anderson there on that show. You've got a four-way for the title. I mean, in their eyes, the four-way for the title is a big match because you're guaranteed a new champion. Therefore, since in their minds that's a big match, EC3 can be a surprise on top of that. Or whoever that fourth person. I don't know who it is. So, it depends. Person says, Chris Jericho is an absolute genius. His demo god line proved that fact once again. Everything that man touches turns to gold. Although we had another one here that said that Uh, The Demo God name is great, but the shirt is ugly. So he's not a fan of of the actual design of the shirt. This person says, How awesome was that Legado del Fantasma vignette shot in their mansion? I truly feel Santos Escobar has been the best Cruiserweight champion since Pac held that title a couple of years ago. WWE has their next big Latino star in front of their eyes. Him and Angel Garza, how can you miss them? It's like I wrote that text. I, I talked about this yesterday, Brian and Vinny show. They've been looking for a big Latino star, big Hispanic star, since, like, the heyday of Rey Mysterio. And the funny thing is, they never were willing to go all the way with Rey Mysterio because he was small. I mean, they gave him the title, but everybody knows the story. Like, they didn't want to give him the title. And and everybody convinced Vince McMahon to make him the champion. And Vince McMahon's whole mindset was, fine, but he ain't going to be champion for long. And when they gave him the belt, they beat him, beat him, beat him, beat him. And then they beat him and took the title off of him. 
So, I mean, I guess you have to go before Ray to Eddie Guerrero. They've been looking for that big star ever since. And they tried it with Alberto Del Rio. But, you know, Alberto Del Rio had a million issues. They also didn't know what they were doing with the guy. You know, the whole babyface turn, his heel run. I mean, it was botched. You can go back and listen to the shows. You know, they just couldn't do it right with him. And if he hadn't had issues, I mean, that should have been your guy. And, you know, Angel Garza, I feel, is a can't miss. But he doesn't have the size that Vince McMahon loves. And I look at at Santos Escobar, I think he's a can't miss. How can you not miss with this guy? If you're looking for a Hispanic Latino superstar, how can you miss with the former Ijo Del Fantasma? Well, they're doing it. They're doing great in NXT main roster. I guess we'll have to see what he has going for him. As he speaks perfect English, that's what they're looking for. Why, if you're looking for a Hispanic Latino superstar to attract that audience, do you need a guy that speaks English? I mean, shouldn't he speak Spanish? I mean, historically, all of your big ethnic superstars, I mean, they all spoke the language. But in WWE, it's like, gotta speak English! We'll see what happens. Kyrie Sane, uh, Kyrie Sane being forced to be a heel for most of her time on the main roster is yet another example of WWE being unable to use people correctly from NXT. How long until people start refusing to go to the main roster? People will start refusing to go to the main roster in large numbers, when the amount of money that they make in NXT is the same as the amount of money they can make on the main roster. And there have been there have been people that don't want to go. They made it very clear. Uh, Tommaso Ciampa is one of them. But the reason he didn't want to go was because he did not feel that his body would hold up doing a WWE main roster schedule. But guess what? That schedule is no more. I believe after coronavirus, that schedule will still be no more. So if he's doing the exact same number of matches at NXT that he's doing on the main roster, but he's being offered significantly more money for the main roster, very, very, very few people are going to turn that money down. Some of them will, but it's a very, very small number. If the day comes when they make the same amount of money in NXT because allegedly it's your third brand, all things equal, then I think more and more people won't want to go to the main roster. This person here says, actually, the main event of Great American Bash Night 1 was Sasha versus EO. That's true. Non-title singles match with a surprise Oscar appearance. That is true. I apologize. I think it was a week prior, which I believe NXT also won, that had Sasha and Bayley defending the tag team titles. Back in a moment with more, and I'm going to open up the phone lines, Wrestling Observer Live. Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Your turn to join the show. Not just in the emails and text messages here, but also via the telephone. Ryan is standing by all waiting to go, but we're not going to go to him yet. I'm going to make him wait for a second. So tonight on SmackDown, Bray White's got a Firefly Funhouse segment, which of course is going to set up the Wyatt Swamp fight on Sunday. And there will be a new edition of A Moment of Bliss. So we do have one match which is the AJ Styles-Matt Riddle Intercontinental title match. We'll see what happens there. No, sir, it's a pay-per-view on Sunday, but they're giving away an AJ Styles-Matt Riddle Intercontinental Championship match for free on SmackDown. So that should tell you the concern over the ratings right now, to put that one on free TV as opposed to the pay-per-view. But again, we have one match announced, and the rest is all talking segments. So why do we not have a full card for SmackDown? Why do we not have full cards for these shows that are that are taped in advance? I mean, as Mike noted a couple of days ago, I don't even need to know what the matches are. I would prefer to know what the matches are, but at least tell me who's going to be on the show. Don't even do that. You're going to get two talking segments, and you're going to get an Intercontinental title match. So tune in on a Friday night at 8 o'clock and find out what else you get. Roll the dice. We went down the cards for those two shows. And then, of course, next week, we got Karrion Cross, Dominic Dijakovic, and Killian Day and Dexter Loomis for NXT. Those are the only matches announced for next week's NXT. Meanwhile, AW has announced Cody versus a mystery challenger. Eva Lise returns to AEW for the first time since the Casino Battle Royal. She will take on Diamante. 
This will be the first in-ring action for the Shine Women's Champion since the Shine 65 pay-per-view on February 29th. Hangman Page will be in televised competition for the first time. Singles competition. He's going to do a singles match. He will face five of the Dark Order. And the Jurassic Express will face Chris Jericho and Jake Hager. MJF will also be facing an unnamed opponent as well. So, full card for the AW show. Perhaps he'll tell us some mystery opponents. Perhaps they will not. All right, let's go to Ryan. Ryan, you're on the line. What's going on? My question's about the 30 wrestlers dying from Mexico from the coronavirus. Is there a reason why there hasn't been as many American wrestlers dying? I know Richard Rose from Russell Talk Radio died a couple weeks ago. He's not really a wrestler, so is this a different form of the virus in Mexico? Well, I want to thank you very much for the call. I don't think it's a it's a different form of the virus. I mean, the short answer is, if you look at the death rate for coronavirus all over the world, it is not consistent. There are there are some countries where it's very very low, and there are some countries where it's sky high, and a lot of that has to do with what kind of medical care can you get, how is how is your population's health as a whole, and unfortunately. It's a disaster in Mexico. It's a disaster in Brazil. I mean, it's a disaster in Florida and and Texas and California. We'll find out how big a disaster in a couple of weeks because cases rise, four-week lag, and then here come the deaths, hospitals being overwhelmed, everything like that. So that's the issue. It's not a, a different form of the virus. Should mention Cauliflower Alley Club because of COVID-19 is being postponed. It was originally scheduled for September 21st through 23rd, 2020. And there were a lot of people that were very against Cauliflower Alley trying to run their annual convention because, in fact, a lot of the people that attend Cauliflower Alley, a lot of the legends, are over 65. And over 65 is a very, very high-risk group. And so they have announced that the 55th reunion has been rescheduled for April 25th through 28th, 2021, discount rooms will be available to those that have purchased reunion tickets and have a pass key code from April 21st through 28th, 2021. Gold Host is going to automatically refund existing room deposits to your credit card. Room reservations for the new 2021 dates will begin on December 1st. Everybody who has purchased their 55th reunion tickets as one of three options, you can receive a full refund. You can donate your reunion ticket to the CAC Benevolent Fund for a tax write-off. Or you can leave your deposit on hand to ensure that you have a seat for the April 2021 reunion. Now, I mean, listen, we don't know what's going to happen, but you know, this is scheduled to t- take place in September. I think it's abundantly clear that this is not going to be over in September. Now, is this going to be over by April I am iffy. I mean, if the if the 2021 reunion was in September, I'd be ready to buy my ticket. April, I think it's 50-50 we have this exact same thing happening again. But we can only hope for the best. Let's go to Bellows Falls, Vermont. You're on the air. Who is this? Hey, this is Dagan. I'd like to shout out from the to the Twitch homies in the chat. What's going on, Dagan? Brian, I wanted to get no, not a whole lot. I wanted to get your opinion on John Moxley and who you think should beat him for the title, and who you think will challenge him next. Uh, thanks for taking my call. All right, I want to thank you very much for the call. Well, a couple of things you can do with John Moxley. I believe, I believe that the next person who challenges him for the title. It's probably going to be MJF. And as far as who should win the title next, here, here's the thing. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. In the real world, uh, unless you're just doing things to hot shot or you want to surprise people, I mean, this was what I was always told. And this is what has always made the most sense historically. And superstar Billy Graham, of all people, would argue this as well because he very much disagreed with with uh, 
with Vince McMahon taking the WWF title off of him. He was told a year in advance when he was going to lose the belt, and it was like set in stone. And and he felt now's not the time. That's the answer. When it's time. When the right guy comes along. Let's say that MJF is challenging for the title over uh, the first week of September. Okay, It's almost the end of July. Yes, I looked at the wrong wrist. It's almost the end of July. We got a month and a half. Okay, I can't sit here right now and say... I think now's the time for MJF to beat John Moxley for the title. You got to start shooting the angles. You got to start building it up. And you got to see what happens. And a a perfect example, actually, is when Chris Jericho lost the title to John Moxley. When Chris Jericho won the title, I did not feel in the month, six weeks leading up to it, I did not feel that it was time for Chris Jericho to lose the title. Then they started building up Moxley, and they shot all of their angles and everything like that. And honestly, on the day of the show, I no longer felt the way that I did. In fact, quite frankly, really on the day of the show, I was a little more ambivalent to it. I was like, okay, you know, if Jericho wins, there's a direction that you can go from here. But Moxley is hot. So maybe it's time for Moxley to win the title. And and to me, you, you got to shoot your angles. you got to build it up. And, and there's a feeling that you should have the day of the show. Is it time? Now, the problem is you also want to book long term. So if you're Tony Khan, you need to make that decision at least a little bit in advance. You can't say, well, we're going to build it up and then we'll make our decision the day of the show. Because then you've got to do something the next day. It's exactly what we talked about with NXT. They had, they had two good weeks with the Great American Bash, and then what? What was the follow-up? What did they have for the next week? Not a lot. I mean, they have something for down the line with with Keith Lee and Karrion Cross, but you got to have something for the next day. So, to me, you've got to build this match up. Six weeks, two months, shoot your angles, see how over everybody is, see what the numbers are doing, how hot does MGF get if he's the guy, and then you decide maybe a month out, what are we going to do? And then you go, and you have something planned for down the road. I wish I had a better answer for you, but I don't. It's foolish to decide far in advance and not see where the like, not see the lay of the land, not see how things are going, not see how over somebody's getting. Maybe it's time for MGF to beat him the first week of September, but maybe it's not. And I can't see that far ahead right now. Billy Corgan. A quick note about the National Wrestling Alliance, which I fought for and won ownership of a few years back. We are not shutting down. Please disregard any and all rumor to that effect. Apparently, Raven had done a podcast or something, and he said that that uh, now that Dave Lagana is out, he thinks that Billy Corgan is going to cut down, uh, shut shut the promotion down. I was told uh, a few weeks ago that they absolutely were not shutting down. I think we talked about this here on the air. They're in a restructuring process. They're doing a bunch of different things, but there there was no talk of them shutting down. Now Billy Corgan has got a comment on this. NWA is not and will not be for sale. Those talent who are under contract remain under contract for a reason, which is that we at the NWA are trying to figure out a way to provide our great fans with wrestling content in a very, very tough environment. Most importantly, we want to keep our talent safe and the standard of production that you have come to expect from us at a high level. Anything else, in my opinion, is unacceptable. So yes, appreciate the interest, appreciate the chatter, but we do not appreciate the unsourced rumors and speculation. Let's go to Jacob. You're on the air. What's going on? Hey, what's going on, Brian? Uh, Shout out to the Twitch chat. Uh, I was just wondering, um, for Cody's open challenge, do you think we possibly see some of the ex WWE guys pop up. I think Zack Ryder is a big possibility. And uh, who do you think out of those guys who ends up in AW most likely? Thanks. Yeah, I want to thank you very much for the call. Well, I don't know why I didn't think about that earlier, but yes, as noted, uh, Fighter Fest, Fight for the Fallen, and now this coming Wednesday show. Cards, 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 cards. They always have a card in advance. I mean, even the second week of the Great American Bash, I think going into it, they had like a match or two. 
And then the, everything else they added on social media, even though they had already taped the show. They could have, they could have announced all of the matches, but they didn't. So, AW, I wouldn't say that this is a super stacked show, but you do have a lot of matches announced. And I think Hangman doing a singles match, Jericho and Hager wrestling on the show, MJF in action, the Evil Lease match with uh, Diamante, you could save one WWE star for a surprise. Now, the argument, and Dave talked about this on Wednesday, other people have talked about this as well. I mean, there's a lot of ex WWE guys in AEW. And how many are too many? What's too much? I mean, is, is you know, Zack Ryder, I mean, Zack Ryder did nothing in WWE 95% of the time. This is no disrespect to Zack Ryder. It's just the reality. I mean, they buried the guy forever. They did nothing with him. He was a job guy. I mean, they very briefly won the titles at WrestleMania and then did virtually nothing with them, and then they beat them. I mean, there is there is the argument that do you want to take a guy that they buried forever and bring him in and push him as a big-time star? That's the question. Now, granted, if you're Zack Ryder, is it fair that because another company booked you like a geek that you can never do anything in your career again? No, that's not fair. So it's a question that they're going to have to figure out. Who do they bring in? Who do they use? Who do they push? Back in a moment, Observer Live. Homie's right there. Twitch.tv slash F4W video. Beautiful Brian Alvarez of Portland Wrestling in like 2003. Beating Moondog Ed Moretti. Clean in the middle of the ring via pinfall. Miss Rento Nato at ringside. Man, oh man. Those were the days. Hey, listen. We got another big surprise coming up for twitch homies on sunday sunday will be the extreme rules post show a fundraiser for the great fowler jay is his name as i've noted he'll always be the fowler to me a lot of medical bills a lot of issues we're here to help the great fowler and all of your cheers will be going to the great fowler on Sunday night for our Extreme Rules post show. Only for subscribers to twitch.tv slash F4W video. Lots of different ways to sign up, including if you have Amazon Prime every month, you get a free Amazon Prime Twitch subscription. You can use it on any channel you want on Twitch, including ours. And if you sign up, you will get the live post show on Sunday only for Twitch subscribers. And on top of all of that excitement, the Extreme Rules post-show, the fundraiser for the Great Fowler, we've got a very special surprise coming up on Sunday, live on Twitch for all of you homies. So check it out. And hey, with that, we're out of time here today. I want to thank you all for listening. We had lots of great stuff. Subscribe to WrestlingObserver.com. Over 11,000 podcasts. This show goes up immediately every day. Lots of great stuff up there. The Wrestling Observer Newsletter archives. It's a lot of fun. Obviously, twitch.tv slash F4W video. And for video archives, video.f4wonline.com. We're out of time, everybody. I want to thank you all for listening. Talk to you again next time. Wrestling Observer Live. <laughs>